Hi everyone. So now we're going to talk a little bit about data preparation. Once we've inspected our data, we can start the data preparation process. And there are two very important data preparation techniques to keep in mind. The first is handling missing values, and the second is subsetting data. It's important to investigate missing values because you may be missing information in key variables that are really important for the analysis that you're trying to perform. In some scenarios, it's possible for us to do what's called imputation, where we estimate a value that we can put in place of the missing value. And in other scenarios, we have to just not use that observation. We also find that many data analysis projects focus only on a portion or a subset of the data rather than the entire data set. Or sometimes the objective of the analysis is to compare two subgroups of a larger data set. And in either of these scenarios, subsetting becomes enormously helpful and important for conducting a meaningful analysis. So missing values are really a common data quality problem, but it can lead to a significant reduction in the number of usable observations, as well as introduce bias into the results. The very first step to treating missing values is figuring out why they're missing. For example, if a survey is asking very personal questions, maybe about people's political leanings, religious values, health history, or sexual history, respondents may not be very comfortable answering all of the questions or answering them all truthfully. And this can be one source of missing data. We also know that in many surveys, not every question applies to every respondent, so there may be some missing data there. And in that case, it's probably just fine. It can also be caused by human error, sloppy data collection, or data collection equipment failures. We have two primary strategies for dealing with missing values, omission and imputation. In the scenario with omission, we exclude observations with missing values, and this is commonly done automatically by statistical software, and yes, even by R. This is appropriate when the amount of missing values is small or concentrated in a small number of observations. But before simply accepting omission as an appropriate approach, again, it's important to know why the data are missing. If the pattern of missing data tends to be fairly random, you're probably okay. Imputation, on the other hand, replaces missing values with some reasonable values. In imputation for numerical values, we replace missing values with the mean or average value across the relevant observations. This tends to be very easy to implement. It doesn't increase the variability in the data set. If a large number of values are missing, however, mean imputation can likely distort the relationship among the variables. And this is one of those places where it can really introduce bias into our analysis. We don't want bias. That's bad. There are more advanced methods as opposed to just taking the mean, like using regression for imputation. For categorical variables, we tend to use the mode or the most frequent category to be used for imputation. Another possibility is to create a new category called unknown to reflect the fact that the actual value for that observation is simply just not known. And this is especially useful when data are missing for a specific reason. Then in some scenarios, it may be found that a variable with a lot of missing values is just not important for an analysis 
or it can be represented appropriately by some other variable that doesn't have any missing values or has a lot fewer missing values. And in that case, we can just exclude that variable. And then there are some analytics te techniques, such as decision trees, which we'll get to later on in the course. They're robust and can be applied to data sets even with missing values. So that can be a very handy alternative if our initial instinct and study design does not quite work with the structure of the data and values that we have that are missing. So let's take a look at how we might go about doing some data preparation by looking at the restaurant's data set in R. So first, let's import our restaurant's data into RStudio. Go to File, Import Data Set, Import from Excel, Browse. Now I'm going to go find it on my computer. And now there's a preview of the data that shows up so I can see that it is the right data. So in this data set, we have a record number. Then we have values for ambiance, cleanliness, service, and food. This all looks right. In this case, I want the first row to be as name, so I want to make sure that this is checked. If I uncheck this, the format of the data shifts and is not what we want, so that first row we want to keep that checked as names. We're going to call the data set restaurants, so I'm not going to change the name here. And I think we're ready to go, so I'm going to click import. And now we see that restaurants data is present, and then we also see code in the console where our studio imported that data set for us. So the first thing we might want to do is use the dim function to count the number of observations and variables. So to do this, I'm just going to type dim, D-I-M, and restaurant. And I'm going to press enter. So this tells us that we have 150 rows of data and we have five columns or five variables in our data. So let's look at the first few observations of the data using the head function. So again, I type in head and restaurants. It's important to remember that everything in R and R Studio is case sensitive. So because the name of the data set is restaurants with a capital R, every time I refer to that data set, I have to type restaurants with a capital R. So now this shows us the first six rows of data in the data set. And this gives us a sense of the structure and organization of the data set. Now, if we wanted to look at the whole data set, we would use the view function. And in this scenario, view is capitalized. And what this does is create this view, this spreadsheet style view up here in this window. Now, we can use the is.na function to find observations with missing value. And items marked as true are missing data. So let's specifically inspect the service variable within this data set. So I want to type in is.na and then restaurants, because that's the name of the data set. And then I'm going to use a dollar sign and type service. The dollar sign means that I'm interested in a specific variable 
within the larger restaurant's data set. Now I can press enter, and here we see a lot of true and false words. Where we see the word true, that suggests that there's a missing value there. And we can even see that in the head that we had produced where the second observation for service is listed as NA. So that's a missing piece of data. But when we look at our overall service variable and we look for missing values, there's really not very many that pop out. There's a lot of falses, but there's only a handful of trues that are evident. So in a larger data set, we might just want to know which observations have missing values. And for this, we can use the which function. So we type which. And then in a bracket is period NA, and then restaurants. Use our dollar sign because we're just interested in the service variable. And press enter. So here we see that we are missing values in row 2, in row 100, and row 134. So that helps us understand what data are missing. And in fact, this means that this, these missing values, there's only three of them, so we could omit them. Or because there's only a few that are missing, we could calculate the mean and drop the mean in for those. Now, if we wanted to inspect a specific observation, say row 24, we specify it in the restaurant data frame. So how we would go about doing that, we would type restaurants, then use a square bracket, 24, and then a comma. And this shows us row 24. If we had a number after the comma, it would show us a specific value in that grid. So if it were 24, comma 4, it would show us the item in row 24 and column 4. But if we just leave it as 24, comma, it'll show us all of row 24. So in row 24, that's record number 24, the ambiance has a score of 6, cleanliness has a score of 4, service has a score of 5, and food has a score of six. In another scenario, we might be interested in the number of people who rated service as a seven. And to do this, we can combine the length and the which functions. So length, and then in a bracket, we want to do which, and then we want to do restaurants our dollar sign, we want to do service, two equal signs, and then seven. So this will show us the count of the number of people who rated service as a seven. 47 people out of 150 rated service as a seven. With numerical and categorical variables, we can also use greater than, greater than or equal to, less than, less than or equal to, or not equal to, which is expressed as an exclamation point and an equal sign to find specific values. So, for example, if we wanted to find the number who didn't rate it as a 7, we could do length which restaurants service exclamation point equal sign seven 
and we find that 100 respondents did not rate service as a 7. We know that there's 150 rows in our data set, and 47 plus 100, it does not equal 150. But we know from earlier when we used the is.na function that there are missing that there are three missing values. Rows 2, 100, and 134 are missing data. So as a result, the number of actual ratings in the service column is 147. And if we add 47 and 100 together, we get 147. So that is perfect. But we can even dig into this more granularly. So maybe we're interested in how many rated service as a seven and rated food as being greater than five. And again, we can use the length and which commands to figure this out. So I type in length, which restaurants, and then for service, I want that to be equal to seven. And then I type in an ampersand or an and symbol, and then restaurants. And this time I'm doing the dollar sign and I'm interested in the food rating. So I type in food. And I want that to be greater than five. So I use the greater than symbol and five. So here we see that 17 people rated service as exactly as seven and also rated the food as being greater than five. It takes a bit of time and practice to master where, how, and when to use these different functions and features in R. But once you kind of get the hang of it or you know where to look to reference these things, it can be really, really quick to find these things. There's also a function that can help sort observations, and this is the order function. And I'd suggest creating a new data frame for your sorted data. So we're going to create a data frame called sorted S. And then I'm going to use this arrow. We call that the assignment arrow. Uh, we use this when we're creating something new. And this data frame is going to be based on restaurants. And we're going to order restaurants by service. We're going to close that bracket and then enter a comma. And what this means is that we're going to order this data, this new data frame, by people's ratings for service. So we can't see that, but it did show up over here in data as a new object, and it also has 150 observations of five variables. And if we want to see what this looks like, we can use that view function. And remember, everything in R and R Studio is case sensitive, so sorted S, that last S was capitalized. So I have to make sure I capitalize that second S when I want to view this data set. So we do this and now we see that everything is sorted based on the score for service. So we have a lot of fives, then we get into our sixes, sevens, and then we have our three NAs at the very end. So pause for a second and think about what kind of conclusions you can already draw based on this sort. All four of these categories are rated on a scale from one to seven. And also keep in mind where those missing values end up. 
With this data set, we might also want to sort by more than one variable. And we can do that too. Let's create a new data frame. We're going to call it sorted S F A. We have our assignment arrow and we're going to base this on the restaurant's data. We're going to use our box bracket, the order command. First, we're going to base it on service. So restaurants dollar sign service. Comma. So then the next thing we're going to sort it on is the rating for food. And that's restaurants, dollar sign, food. And then finally, we're going to sort based on ambiance. So SFA, service, food, ambiance. Sometimes you just want to be a little bit practical with how you go about labeling these things. So restaurants, dollar sign, ambiance, and then a comma, so here is an error that has popped up and the trick with this is that I made a spelling error and sometimes errors happen and it's completely fine. What you want to do is carefully read through the error and oftentimes it will give you a hint about where the error is coming from. So because I see that I spelled ambiance with an A instead of an E, that's a simple mistake to fix. Because it's a fairly minor error in my code, I can press the up arrow and it will show me the last line of code that I ran and I can go into the specific line of code. I can change that A to an E and I can run it again. And now we see that we have sorted SFA up here in our environment pane it's something that is now, it exists, it's real. Let's take a look at what this data set looks like using the view function. So here, everything is first ordered based on the surface, then it's based on the food rating, and then it's based on the ambiance rating. And we can see that here, our service, the lowest rating for service we had was five, so we start at five. And then our lowest rating for food seems to be three, so it starts with three. And then with ambiance, we can see first the threes, the fours, the five, and the sixes, and so on. And then if you like this data set and you think this data set would be very helpful for you to use in another piece of software, or you wanna come back to it and use it later, you can actually export this data set as a CSV or a comma separated values file. And CSV files are great. They're very flexible. You can use them in a lot of software, including Excel. So to do that, I would use the write.csv command. I want to export the sorted SFA item. I'm going to type in a comma and then I want to name the file sorted sfa.csv. Press enter and now it has been exported into my working directory. If you're not sure where things are getting saved to or what your working directory is, you can just use the get wd function and then two brackets press enter. So for me, anything that I export or create from our studio is going into C users JL Fraser slash documents. So that's where that exported file has gone.
So another important data preparation task is the treatment of extremely large or small variables or outliers. And we don't have any in this data set. But when we discover outliers, it's important to make sure that they're not the result of data collection or input error. So for example, if we had a score for cleanliness that was, say, 13, that's an outlier. And we would have to determine if that was accurate or an error. In this data set, all of our categories are rated on a scale of 1 to 7. So we know that if there were a value of 13 in one of our categories, that this outlier is an error. But it's important to keep an eye out for outliers in any data set that you're working with. And when there are true and actual outliers, when you impute a value into a missing value, you want to use the median instead of the mean to impute the missing values. So to find complete cases in our data set, Instead of looking at an individual variable, now we're going to look at the entire data set. And we want to find the complete cases, the cases where our record has values for all four of our categories of ambiance, cleanliness, service, and food. And to do this, we want to type in the name of our data set, which is restaurants. We want to use the box bracket for complete dot cases and then restaurants and a comma then we'll press enter and we'll see our complete cases it shows us the first 10 but then it tells us that there is 135 more rows so given that we have 150 rows of data, finding the incomplete cases might be just a little bit more helpful. So to do that, we use, very, we use a very similar line of code. Restaurants, because again, that's what we're looking in. Use our box bracket, an exclamation point, and then complete cases. Then once again, restaurants and a comma afterward. And what we find is that we have five incomplete cases. And this is very handy because it shows us exactly what information is missing from each of those five cases. So we see, for example, that in row two, we're just missing the service rating. But in row 134, we're missing the rating for both ambience, ambience and service. This isn't a lot of missing data, so it may be quite reasonable just to go ahead and omit these data points from our analysis. So to omit, we use the function na.omit. So I would suggest creating a new data frame, and we're going to call it omission data. This way, the original restaurant's data set is unchanged, but I'm now creating a new data set where I omit these values that does not do anything to the original data set. It is often wise to preserve your original data set so that if you make some crazy mistake, you can always go back to where you started and start over. So we're going to create this new data frame called omission data, but we're going to do it omitting those values that are missing. So we use na.omit. And then restaurants, because that's the data set that we're basing our new uh, work from. Press enter, and now we see under data in our environment tab that omission is created. 
and it only has 145 observations as opposed to 150 because we've omitted those values that are missing data. And we can check this by viewing the data set. And what we see here is that for record number, it goes from one to three because record number two was one of the ones that was missing data. And we can see the same thing going from record number 12 to 14. Record number 13 was one of the records that was missing data. So now that's not here in this data set. So now we may find this data set a little bit cleaner and easier to use and work with. We can also take the other approach where we're using the simple mean imputation approach. So we can calculate the average using the mean function and we can create a new object that Will it will place the mean value for restaurants and service where we have missing uh, values. So to calculate our value for our service mean, we're going to create a new object and we're going to call it service mean. Again, using our assignment arrow and we're going to calculate the mean of the service variable. We want to make sure that we exclude the missing values as we calculate this mean value. And we do this using the na.rm function. We set that to true. We do not want to include those missing values. So now under global environment, we have our data sets, but now we have a specific value, and that is our mean value for service. To impute the missing values in the service variable, we can use the is.na function again. So let's give that a try. So we're doing this in the service variable. So we start with restaurants service, Block, we use our box bracket, is dot na, again, restaurants and service, and then we want to use this assignment arrow because in these missing values, we want to include the value for service mean. So I'm going to type in service mean. I'm going to uh, press enter and we don't see anything yet, but if we view restaurants, what we now see for record number two is our service mean value of 5.96. And if I scroll down, we'll see it again in the other places where we were missing values for service. So all the way down in observation 100, for example, here, we now see the mean, and then we'll see it again in row 134. Now, I challenge you to try and make the same changes for the other variables like food and ambiance. And that's all I have for you this time. Thanks for sticking around, and next time we're going to dig into some subsetting.